So good evening, everybody. I hope that you all are not so tired after a day's work. And <clears throat> even though you are tired, you coming here shows your effort in practicing dharma. So that's very good. <coughs> also, so uh, in the previous session, we are talking about cause and effect and karma and uh, how it affects us. Also, I was talking about cause and effect because in uh, Nagarjuna's text, a letter to a friend is mostly about good karmas and bad karmas and the effects of them. It's mostly about that. So I was talking about that. So as Lord Nagarjuna, uh, Lord Nagarjuna is sending this letter to his friend and it's a letter to a friend. You should think of me also as a friend who is just sharing his experiences or sharing what I know with you all. So uh, you can regard me as a friend and be comfortable. Okay. So yesterday we talked about good actions and before in the previous session we talked about good actions and bad actions and the general cause and effect. So good actions, we, in that we summarize that through good actions we can have good experiences, uh, we can gain happiness and uh, through bad actions we'll have bad exper experiences and uh, like uh, have it will have its negative effects on us so we talked about that and uh, even though we talked also about even though Lord Nagarjuna was a bodhisattva he had to experience an uh, effect of his bad actions in his previous lives so it's very important that we think of good karma and bad karma and we need to reflect on what we do on a daily basis is very important uh, there are instances of kadam teachers, great practitioners of dharma, uh, counting at night before they go to sleep, them counting what they have done in the, how much good deeds they have done in the morning to the day. Actually there is one, inst one story of one of the practitioners keeping white stones and black stones and whenever he committed a good karma or a good action he would put one stone down and whenever he committed a bad karma he would put the black stone down and at night he would count them and compare them and if he had done if the white stone was more than the black stone, he would congratulate himself saying, today you have done a very good deed and you have done more good than bad. So congratulate, he congratulated himself. And when he, if, when he counted, if the black stone was more than the white stone, he would scold himself. He would scold himself. You foolish guy, why are you committing more bad 
than good. So that story actually shows us that we must reflect on ourselves. We must reflect on what we do on a daily basis. We must reflect whether what we do is good or what we do is bad. It's very important. Or also, we must reflect the work we do, whether it's harming others or whether it's benefiting others. It's very, imp it's very important to think of these things as a practice practitioner if you want to practice something or if you want to even if you want to start a small work you have to think of okay if i do this work what will be we usually think of like that if i do this what will happen so we try to enlarge that thinking and say we are, I'm doing this work. How much is it harming others? How much is it benefiting others? In my daily Dharma practice, how much is it benefiting me? How much is it harming myself? We, we are a very funny type. We as humans. We really want to be happy. But, as I told in the previous session, we only see the, like, uh, we don't think of the long-term long -term benefits. We think of short-term short benefits, usually. We only think of that. Suppose, if somebody hits you, somebody hits you, you get very angry, and you hit them back. At that time, you may feel satis you may feel a satisf satisfaction that he hit me, I hit him back, and you may feel satisfied that I have done this. So actually, so you are getting a short term satisf satisf satisfaction. But if you really want happiness and if you really want to be happy, when you think about it, you are not being very clever. If you are hitting back and getting angry fast, you are not being so clever. You are not helping yourself. You are not benefiting yourself. So at the time, at the short at the time when you are angry, it may seem satisf satisfactory to you that you perform that action of hitting him back and getting angry at him. But when you think of it later and you reflect upon it, you think, oh, at the time I got angry. So even in the long term benefit, like previous, sorry, not previous, next life or your like you you have to take many rebirths so in your next life it may cause you great deal of bad experiences so when you think of the long term not only of this life if you just think of this life also it would be like okay suppose you are an angry person Suppose you get angry, uh, you're short-tempered, you get angry easily. The effects of that in this life, you would see, are people's bad-mouthing him or her. Like, this guy or this girl is very angry. And he's very short-tempered. And uh, they they would find it difficult to approach you, difficult to befriend you. So if you look at the sudden effect, it's like, uh, what do we say? 
you are not getting many friends. Also, I think there are research that says if you get angry on a daily basis, that your blood pressure may also be high. You would gain higher BP or you would get hypersensitivity. So actually, I think they have done a test. When, when the person was angry, they measured his BP. At that time, the BP was very high. So when you think of it, when you think of the sudden effects also, it's like not beneficial for you. Rather, if you have a calm mind and think of it, actually, when we get angry and when we hit back, we are acting upon our impulses, the impulse to hit him. We need to learn to control that, learn to control our impulses. So it's very important that we do that. Let me give you an example. Suppose there is a dog. Uh, suppose there is a dog that's always angry, always barking whenever somebody comes. Then when you or anybody come to that house, you will feel uneasy. There's a dog. Will that dog bite me? Is that dog an angry dog? Or you will feel that kind of uneasiness. You, you will find that dog unapproachable. Like you would have, at the back of your mind, you would have a sense of fear. What will happen if I go near this dog? If the dog is like an angry type. Whether, and you won't want to pet the dog. And you think, if I pet this dog, what if this dog, dog bites my hand? So you'd have this type of many different type of feelings towards that dog. So on the other side, if it's a very gentle dog and very like gentle, approachable dog, not angry dog, whichever dog, whichever person comes, like it's very approachable. You would want to pet that dog and you would like being with that dog, befriending it. So that's just an example for a dog. So if you apply it to yourself, if you are an angry person, if you are always short-tempered, get angry on small things, then other people would find it very uncomfortable, uneasy to approach you. Whether as if you are a calm-minded person and you are approachable, more befriendable. So these are the, suppose getting angry is a bad action. Getting angry and acting upon that impulse while you are angry is also a bad action. So when you look at the short term and the long term benefits, even though you may get a satisfac satisfaction that you have done something when that person has done something, if you look at it carefully, we, when you are in a calm state of mind, if you look at it, analyze it, whether it's really beneficial or not, you'd find that it's more harmful to you than it's beneficial. Exactly, it's, it's the same for other afflictive emotions, negative emotions. It's the same for everything, every bad, bad actions. So that's that. So today, we were we are going to talk about, also we are going to talk about how karma applies in our own life. So karma meaning good action or bad action. So that's the anger causing us harm, causing yourself harm is one example of how bad karma affects our life, how it applies itself on our life.
it's one example. Whether it's if you are generous, if you are compassionate, that's a good karma, right? That's a good karma. So I can give you many living examples of, not living exactly, but many examples of person being compassionate. And even though she was poor, do you know about Mother Teresa? Yes, right. So suppose Mother Teresa was a very compassionate, very kind person. The effects of her being kind, even though she may not have thought of uh, getting famous, the effects of that, her being kind, is her being famous, even though she may not have the intention of becoming famous, that's just a side effect of being so kind, being so compassionate. So like that type, we have many, many uh, different examples of the effects of good karma. Similarly, when you think of Hitler, <laughs> you think he got famous. He got famous, of course. He got famous, but for the wrong reasons. So when we think of somebody like that, we also think he caused that. It causes a little bit of discomfort in our own mind. So you can see there is a effect of good karma and you, you can see there is a bad effect also. Now whether you want the bad effect or whether you want the good effect, that's entirely up to you, how you practice, right? If you want to become like, say, the Buddha, or if you want to become like the Hitler or other people like that. So it's entirely up to you. So that's the thing. That's, the, that's how good karma and bad karma applies in our life. <coughs> so the Buddha, the Buddha, when we see Buddha, we think of him as a finished product. We don't see, we don't see the if effort that he has put into becoming a Buddha. <coughs> so we must learn about what effort did he put into becoming a Buddha. Buddha. He was compassionate. He practiced compassion. He practiced emptiness, and so on. There are many practices. So us being left in this samsaric cycle and him being liberated from this samsaric cycle is the difference of him practicing good karmas and uh, what cultivating his good karmas more and more he was able to attain buddhahood while we we indulged more in our bad karmas and in the cultivated it more. That's why we are left in this samsaric suffering cycle. That's why we suffer. So, yesterday I told you the Four Noble Truths were, mm, Four Noble Truths were the foundation of Buddhism. When I told that, it was simply saying, Buddha followed the second two paths, saying the end to the path of suffering, and uh, he got to the end of the path of the suffering. While we, we are practicing, <laughs> not practicing, unknowingly practicing, unknowingly practicing through our ignorance, we are unknowingly practicing the second two, which are, we are, truth of the cause of the suffering, we are creating many causes for us to suffer. So we are creating many causes. We are not remedying these causes. We are not um, reflecting and trying to 
reduce those causes of suffering. And we are, we are experiencing the effects of it. So actually, Buddha practiced the second two, and we practice, don't say if I should use the word practice, uh, I think I should unknowingly practice to our ignorance. So that is something that we should keep in mind, that we are creating the cause for our suffering. Suppose, let's say, there is an, suppose there is, suppose some, somebody gets angry with you and you get angry with them and you too indulge in a verbal bad actions. You try to hurt him as much as you can with your own words and he try, he or she, she may try to hurt you with her bad words. At that time, you two are indulging in that. So, you two are creating the cause. And when you, we, first, at first, you two were good friends, but after indulging, there was a awkwardness that when you met tomorrow, after you have indulged in this, you'll feel a type of awkwardness, when, uh, awkwardness, sorry, awkwardness when meeting him. If you just simply say, I'm sorry, I was, my mental state of mind was not at its best. It's simple to get out that, that awkwardness. And also the other person, if he accepts his uh, apology and he also uh, apologizes, sorry, <laughs> apologizes, I don't know <laughs> this, <laughs> okay, whatever. So if he says, also says sorry, that's better. <laughs> if he also says sorry, then the awkwardness will be gone. Also, that's a simple way of doing it. But we complicate it. We just leave it, leave the awkwardness to be there and we let it get bigger and bigger as the days go. And later, the friend that you had will, may become your e enemy. So, that's one state. If we, of course, we don't live in a perfect world, there will be anger, there will be verbal, um, what do you say, miscommunications, and we will talk bad about others. We don't live in a perfect world. But if you were to simplify these matters, it wouldn't arise that much. So that's, that's something that we have to keep in mind, that we are creating the cause of our own suffering. So that is one thing that we must keep in mind. Also, uh, for the effect to arise, it's very important that there is a cause. That's one of the, one of the main things that uh, you should keep in mind. <coughs> so, the most important thing that you must keep in mind, if you want to avoid bad, bad experiences and suffering and have good experiences and have a happiness, you must refrain from doing bad actions and try to do as much as good actions as you, you must. Even if you cannot do good actions, you, just by refraining from doing bad actions, that's helping you in a way. You are not piling up the causes of your suffering. You are not, you are not putting more money into the bank for the interest to rise. So that's a way that we must do. 
then sometimes we may think, why must I refrain from doing bad karma? And uh, what do we say? Mm, do more good actions, good karma. We may think like that. If I get angry, that's me. We may think of it. That's me. That's my own experience. That's my own experience. Why, do, why must I think? I don't care if I feel bad. I don't care if I uh, have a bad experience, have sickness in my life. Sometimes we may think like that. But then we ask the question again. Why did you get angry in the first place? Of course, when you get angry, it's something related to you. It's something related to you, that's why you are getting angry. Suppose somebody said bad about you, you are getting angry because of that. Or someone made up a rumor about you, you are getting angry because of that. In a way, you getting angry is somebody else is not harming you. You think like that. You think like somebody else, some, there was someone that who caused anger to you is causing harm to you. So at that time, when somebody is causing harm to you, because we have that desire for, we have that, we have that, we care for ourselves very deeply. That's why we are getting angry. Then, if you are not feeling like, I can do bad karma because it's my experience. So, then we ask the person again, why are you getting angry? It's because he cares for himself. He doesn't want the bad experience at the bottom, from the bottom of his heart or bottom of his mind. He doesn't want the harmful experience. He wants the blissful experience. He may be saying that, but he's in a type of self-denial, let's say, self-denial, which he's not accepting that he wants happiness. So, it's very important that you refrain from doing bad karma and indulge in good karma, simply because we care for ourselves. Even if you cannot think of benefit of others, you think of yourself. There may be people that think of yourself. There are people that think of all benefit, benefits of all, right? So, first, you would think, because I want happiness. If you want real happiness, then you must not indulge in bad activities, bad actions. So that's that. So to think of not indulging in bad actions, it's very funny. We indulge, when we indulge on it, we don't think of it much, right? Suppose we get angry. Angry is the most easiest part. We get angry. At that time, does patience come to you? Not exactly. So one of the main thing is you must think of one thing uh, why this like uh, when we get angry suddenly we, we don't think of we don't get patient is because we are not practicing enough. Why are we not practicing enough? That's because we don't know suffering exactly. We know suffering, like we know sudden suffering of suffering, which is like us suddenly getting headaches or getting pricked by a needle 
That's the suffering of suffering. We know that type of suffering. So, for you to refrain from doing bad actions, first you must think of suffering. There are many different types of suffering. Those, you are, those of you who are more experienced may know that there are hell, sufferings of hell, sufferings of samsara. So exactly what is suffering? We must ask that question. We know the suffering of suffering, which is prick, getting pricked by a nejo. Of course, we don't want suffering. All of us human beings, we don't want to do anything with suffering, right? Even an ant, something small as an ant, if we try to kill it, if we just try to just kill it, it will try to run away. Isn't that? Even lizards or cockroaches. If we try to kill it, if, it's, if it sees a shadow that's coming to press it down, it will try to run away. Even the smallest beings, so smallest living beings like that, have the want to not to suffer. Of course, we as a human being are more advanced than them in a regard. But in that regard of not wanting suffering, we are all the same. They don't want suffering. You don't want suffering. So we are the same in that regard. So, <clears throat> our untrained mind we don't think much of suffering. We only think of suffering when it occurs. Right? Suppose you have a headache, then you think, I'm suffering. I'm suffering from a headache. I'm suffering from my pain. But when we are on the calm state of mind, we don't think of suffering. So, it's important to think of suffering when we are not suffering. So then you may think, if I'm thinking of suffering when I'm not suffering, am I suffering? <laughs> so you may think of it like that. But when, when I say you think of suffering, not thinking of the bad times you had, not thinking of the effect that you had, but thinking if thinking it in an analytical way, not thinking, oh, this happened to me, this happened to me, and not feeling depressed about what, you ha what had happened to you, but looking at it through a detached, analytical way, not being depressed that this happened to me, I hope that this never happens to me, this type of suffering happened. Suppose you have gone through some type of trauma, not thinking it as uh, a depressed way, not being too caught up in that, but to think of it in that way, like there is suffering. You must always think of it, it's very important. As a, as a beginner to practice bodhicitta or anything, it's very important to think of it. So what is suffering? The suffering of suffer there are actually three types of suffering. The suffering of suffering, change of suffering, and the pervasive suffering. So we don't need to go mu so much into that. We have mental and physical suffering, which we usually have. Mental suffering is, of course, mental stress is one of them. Mental suffering is you having the opinion that, oh, what is that people thinking of me? That is also suffering. The, what the other people think of you, that's also one of the suffering. And also one of the suffering is you not knowing and being left out 
and the feeling of being left out of a certain society. That's a type of suffering, a mental suffering. It's not physical suffering, it's mental suffering. So, between the two, which one do you think is more stronger? The mental suffering or physical suffering? Huh? <laughs> do you, most, I think it's the mental suffering, right? Even though you have a perfect physical state, even though you are healthy in your body, if your mental state is not healthy, we can say healthy for a mental state, not in a calm state, if you are too much of getting into these types of emotions, then you are causing suffering for yourself, isn't that? So we can see mental suffering in many types. We can see like someone having no wealth, but they are at the peace of their mind, with, they are content with what they have. So, between the two, I think mental suffering is one that ails this world the most, one of the most. Physical suffering, in a way, we can have a little bit of control over it. Suppose you are getting a headache, then you can have a aspirin. Is it aspirin we have here? Aspirin or some type of medicine. Yeah, some type of medicine. So in a physical suffering, we can in a type control. But mental suffering is the one that we can't, unless you are a practice, unless you practice for a long time, you won't have the control over it. We let our emotions arise uh, and we let we get too stuck in it so that's two sufferings mental suffering and physical suffering so from the time that we are born to the time that we pass away we are suffering at the first when we are born we are suffering at the time that we are going to pass away, of course we would have problems with our breath and everything, and then that is also suffering. Between that two, there is the suffering of getting old, suffering of physical pain, etc. like that. So all of these are suffering. Also, we have the suffering of not knowing things. Not knowing. We also suffer from wanting more discontentment. We are not content with what we have. I think there is a sh uh, saying. I think it's an English poem or something like that. I wanted a shoe. I think you know that. I wanted a new shoe. He already had a uh, torn shoe, but I wanted a shoe, a new shoe. Until I saw a person with no legs. So that type of saying, in a way, it implies we are not content with what we have. The person who has no legs Compared, when you compare yourself to him, then of course you have your legs and you still have something to wear on. Then that shows a way of how you can be content. So contentment is very important. One of the things that because of we are not satisfied enough, we want more and more. That's why we work more and more and more. I'm not saying that you should not work. Of course you should work. But 
uh, you must think of the, you must be content. Do you get what I mean? You must be content with what you have, must not be dissatisfied with what you have. That's one of the things. <coughs> we must, in this modern world, we are so stuck in money making or so stuck in the process of wanting more and making money that we forget why are we making the money for so we must strike a balance between that we must be content also make money so that that there must be a type of balance we must be content with that in a layperson's term so <coughs> That's one type of suffering that we have. Also, we may think our friends and colleagues gives us happiness. Our friends give us, us happiness. We share the happiest moments between them. But friends, even though they are friends, later, to the uncertainty, of samsara that friends may become your enemies like the if you have an argument you you two may become enemies so that's the one what do we call it the suffering of uncertainty there's no certain that you will remain friends for life we may say best friends forever <laughs> But we are not sure, we are uncertain, we can be certain. So that's one of the suffering. Also we have the suffering of thinking too much about the future. Thinking too much about the future. Thinking, mm, let's say, what will happen? What will happen if I do this? What will happen if I, when I reach this? Even when you have not contracted a disease you may be thinking what if I contract this disease you are thinking too much into the future and we have the suffering of thinking too much into the future and we also have suffering of being separated from our loved ones which is also an uncertainty of samsara so these are we have countless number of sufferings even though we may not think we, we usually think of suffering as a physical, physical suffering. When we experience something, if you burn your hand, if you, at that time we say we suffer. But when you are at rest, when you are not suffering from physical, we say, I'm not suffering. So is it really that you are not suffering or are you really suffering? That's the question we must ask. So, if you are, if you are more practiced, uh, if you know more about Dharma, or if you want to know more about it, you can read in Jeremiah's treatise of the, what's that called? L Lamrim? Yeah. Lamrim I don't know the exact term of, do you know? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. The great treatise on the part of enlightenment. In that, he has highlighted many things like the six sufferings, eight sufferings of our samsaric cycle. So these are the sufferings that we usually face. The suffering of being separated from loved ones, the suffering of thinking too much and thinking about also, this may also be called a suffering. You thinking, thinking of suffering, which is causing you <coughs> suffering. <laughs> so that is also a type of suffering. But as I told you before, you must think of, there is certainty that you are suffering, but you must not think of suffering. If you think of it as a 
fact of life, then you would be able to not be depressed about thinking of suffering. So that's one thing. Also, we have the suffering of different realms, like the hell realm and the, um, like the hungry ghost realm and the dog animals realm. So, suppose for the hells, you can look up in the great treatise on the path of enlightenment and uh, the animals they don't they have suffering of not knowing and being foolish right suppose they also have the fear of being eaten by an another animal suppose you are a deer you have the fear of being surviving in the wild so that type of there are many types of suffering so as we all we accept rebirth you must think what if i'm born into this then what type of this type of sufferings are there then i don't want to be born into this type of suffering so then we must oh what is causing all this suffering? We must think like that. We must not be depressed that if I, be, if I am born like that, I would, get, I would have a lot of suffering. We must not be depressed by the fact that, by thinking like that. But we must think in a, okay, there is this type of suffering. So how do I, what are, cause, first we must think of, what are causing this suffering? So, what is causing the suffering? Suppose, uh, suppose you are getting angry on somebody, and what is causing that suffering? It's your mental suffering, right? Suppose, okay, not to say angry, but when you are suffering, when you are wanting more, Suppose there is a new thing that has come out and you want that thing very badly and you lose sleep, sleep over it. In the day you think of it, thinking, I want that thing. How do I get that thing? How do I get the money for that thing? So in a way you are suffering from wanting more. And that is easy because when you get that thing, your suffering ends, right? So that is type of easy to end. But the problem is, as we indulge more or more on wanting more, our desire becomes more getting, it gets not say cultivated, but almost same as cultivated. It gets, you get more desire if you indulge in desire so that type of thing is also there so we must be very careful so we must ask the we we now know that there is suffering right of course there is suffering that is a fact there are different types of suffering also the bliss that we may feel from a fan while we are feeling hot we may feel cold if we suddenly on the AC, we feel a bliss of getting your body cold, right? So in, in a way, that is also suffering. Because for an example, I'll give you, if you have a pure gold, how do you check if it's a pure gold or not? Usually they say a blacksmith or a goldsmith he would try to cut it and see if there are anything mixed with it. If there is nothing mixed with it, then the goldsmith would say it's a pure gold, right? So the bliss that we are experiencing when we are feeling so hot and we just on the AC, the bliss that we are just experiencing, it's also suffering. Because why is it suffering? Because we if we 
indulge too much on that. We on put the AC at 19C and just stay here. After some time, we'll start to feel cold. And we'll say, oh, I'm feeling cold now. Now I need to up the temperature. So we up the temperature. After upping the temperature, you may feel a little bit at ease. Now again, you are feeling the hot. And you are now, you want to lessen the temperature. So what I'm saying here is, if it was real bliss, real happiness, real feeling of happy, it should be like the way the gold is. How much ever the goldsmith cuts it, he finds nothing mixed with it. It must be like that. But when we indulge in it, it shows that it has a type of suffering in it. If we indulge too much on that, we we have suffering. So there are many types of suffering. So the thing is, what is suffering? First, you must understand suffering. If you don't know of all that suffering, just focus on what you know right now, the suffering of physical suffering, which we know physical and mental that we have. Just focus on that. So we ask the question now, what is causing this suffering? Then, Uh, we ask the question, what is causing this suffering? We must analyze and we must think of it. What is causing? Suppose um, you are getting a back pain every morning you get up and you realize it's because you have put it on, you put the AC on too cold, then you must up the temperature when you, co when you sleep, right? To end the of and the effect of you getting back pain every time you sleep, you must turn off the AC or lessen the temperature of the AC, right? Like that, you must end the cause that is causing you the... So we must ask what is causing the uh, suffering. At that time, uh, it's we will find that it's simply because of us not knowing how to handle that situation that is causing us suffering. In a way, we call it ignorance. Ignorance is causing us suffering. The effect of suffering is arising because we don't have the knowledge of how not to cause the suffering. So, in a way, we call it ignorance. We, we are ignorant of the fact that bad actions cause bad uh, experiences and good actions cause good uh, experiences. We are ignorant of that fact. So, in a way, ignorance, one of the main causes of you experiencing these <coughs> negative experiences is because of the Ignorance. We are ignorant of the cause and effect. If we know truly from our heart that truly from our heart, not just saying truly from our heart, we know that good realize, let's say realize from our heart that good actions causes good experiences and bad actions causes bad experiences. We would refrain from doing bad actions and we would indulge in good actions. But us being ignorant of that fact and us being short-sighted, as we say, we are not able to know about that. An example would be, if you really know from the heart that this mug is super hot, you wouldn't touch it, right? If you really know from the heart, if you know there's an uh, iron that is super hot, if you realize it that that is super hot from the bottom of your heart, you won't touch it. Whereas, 
if you don't know that iron is hot and that iron looks like cool type, if you don't know from the bottom, you would you may touch it, right? So it's like that we don't realize from the bottom of our heart that good actions causes good experiences and bad action causes bad experience. That why that's why we act on impulses. Suppose you getting angry, you wanting to hit somebody, you act on that impulse and hit that body somebody. We are not thinking of the long term after the non direct conse consequences. So in a way ignorance is causing you a lot of ignorance is one of the cause. So how to get rid of this ignorance? If you go more into depth, you may go into practicing emptiness or so. But for a beginner or for a beginner begin practitioner who is just beginning, it's important that you refrain from doing good karma. Sorry, not <laughs> I made that's a <laughs> not a refrain. You ref you refrain from doing bad karma. So that means that I haven't realized. <laughs> uh, you refrain from doing bad karma and you indulging in good karma. So for a beginner, that thing is most important. Yesterday I talked about incompatible, is because, and I also gave an analogy of lemon seed giving a lemon tree not a mango because these two are incompatible right exactly good karma mm, giving you bad experience is incompatible also bad karma giving you good experience meaning in the future fut traditional effects in the long term effects is incompatible so, for a beginner, it's very important for you not to be ignorant of good action causing good karma, sorry, good action causing good experiences and bad action causing bad experience. That is the, what do we say, the law, not only as a law of the world, if you do something good, you will get something good. That's just a type of things, right? So these are the these bad actions may be the causes of you getting suffering. So actually, there are like many, many bad karmas, countless bad karmas. We can't remember all of them, of course we can't. Then what must we do is, we must think of the 10 non vicious karmas as a beginner. If you are more practiced, then of course you can go more into emptiness and like that. For a beginner, it's very important that you refrain from doing this 10 non vicious deeds and you indulge in the opposite of that 10 vicious deeds so actually there are 20 which of the 10 are non vicious and 10 are vicious so 10 non vicious is killing of course you must refrain from killing which is causing harm to somebody else and stealing which is not taking somebody else's thing and sexual misconduct so these are the three physical mis th one three physical non vicious actions these three we must refrain at all costs from our body this all of this occurs because of our body then there are four verbal non vicious actions which is lying divisive speech, offensive speech, senseless speech. 
this all causes disharmony, right? Lying, suppose you lie, then you have to lie for that lie. You have to compile lies to keep the point of the first lie. So lying is also very bad. And divisive speech meaning you creating a rift between two people, even though they don't have anything against each other, you creating, okay, this person said that, she said that to you, and creating a rift between persons. Offensive speech meaning, of course you know offensive speech, not talking, not talking badly to others, talking in a gentle way. So, senseless speech, meaning gossip. Of course, we like to gossip a lot. We like fake news. We like to gossip. That's, that's kind of our nature, right? So, we must refrain from that. Actually, we may be gossiping, but in a way, it may be causing harm to us, somebody, someone else's reputation or someone else's we may gossip but because it may be a baseless gossip but that baseless gossip is causing harm to somebody some people may think that that is true and that's why they elevate it and it becomes a big issue so we must refrain from that and covetness <coughs> which is wanting something so bad that you lose, wanting something that is of others. It's almost like type of stealing, not stealing, stealing, but from your heart you want that other person's something. So m malice, which is you wanting to hurt somebody, you wanting to hurt somebody, of course it's not good for you to hurt somebody so that's the thing if you want to if you had that want to hurt somebody then at a point may come where you will actually hurt that somebody so that's not good and wrong views oh so these are the train 10 main ones if you are a beginner even if you don't know all of the practices these are the 10 main ones that you should refrain from. Also, indulge in the opposite of that. S stealing is, stealing's opposite is uh, generosity. And killing is non-killing. If you are, suppose you are sub trying to kill an ant, and just your hand goes like this, suppose there's an ant here, your hand goes like, and refraining from that, oh, I'm a Buddhist, I must not kill. If you think like that, that's the time when you are applying your practice. That's the time when the practice is needed. So, suppose there's an ant here, and you just say, let this be. That's the time when your practice is not being applied. That's the time when you know whether you are practicing or not. So it's very important that you refrain, refrain from doing this. If you do this, there are many negative effects of it, which I'll talk into as now, when we go into this de text, I think from text number, text verse number 37 and 64 to some somewhere around there, they have the Nagar Lord Nagarjuna has mentioned uh, the negative effects of being bo doing all this. So these are the these are the things that you should refrain from. So for a beginner, it's very important to refrain from harming others and not indulging on this ten acts, 10 actions and trying to be a good person to helping others. For a beginner practice, that's the most important thing. Even if you are advanced one, sometimes you may lose the basic. 
Sometimes you may think you are practicing emptiness, but you may lose the basic. So it's very important. Then we must actually think of it. Think of the negative effects that arise from the ten of it. If you think of it daily, then you would have, when, suppose the negative, I'll just give you an example. So a negative if effect of killing is you, your life lifespan getting shorter and having many illnesses in the that's one of the effects of killing so when you think of when you are not at a, when you are at the calm state of mind when you are thinking like that when you are thinking like that you in a way are analyzing and thinking that the effect of this is that so when you actually when you go to kill something some living being you would actually feel a type of uh, something stopping you from doing it that's because you have practiced it when you are at a calm state of mind practicing meaning thinking of the reason why we must not do this not just Practicing, I should not kill, I should not kill. Not just reciting it, but also thinking of the meaning. So, we must think of the good karma and its effects, and bad karma and its effects. When we think more and more about it, as a begin even if you are a beginner, you will have a, reach a certain point when you are about to kill, you would refrain from it. Your practices must be applied when there is something about to occur right if you say you practice and when something occurs you are not able to apply that practice that means you have not been a good practitioner suppose you say you are practicing on a patience and somebody says you are a bad person and you suddenly get angry then if you, of course, you will get angry, but when you get angry, if you are able to arise patience on that time, it is that you have practiced very well. If you are not getting angry, that means you have practiced perfectly. If you get angry at that time and later, oh, I got angry at that time, that was not good, I should have had patience. That means you have practiced not good, but less than good. So if that type of thought doesn't arrive, if you get angry and you are thinking, it's good that I got angry to him and he, because he hurt me in a way. So I am feeling very satisfied that I got angry to him. That means you have not practiced all at all. So. When someone shows you, when someone else is making you angry and at the time if you are able to apply your practices, that's the time when you know whether you have really practiced or not. So the, for the beginner it's very important that you refrain from doing, doing these 10 things which is actually easy, right? Non-killing is not easy. <laughs> actually, non-killing, yeah, non-killing is a little bit hard if you think about it. <laughs> so, actually, if you work towards being a good human being, you are also working towards being a good practitioner of Buddha's Dharma. If you are a lying person and you are not a good human being, then you are not also not a good practitioner of Buddha's Dharma. So as a summary, I will, uh, I would say that know that we have suffering and think, analyze what are the causes of the suffering and think of 
the law of the karma, good law causes good experiences, sorry, good action causes good experiences, bad action causes bad experiences, reflect on that and then reflect on how much good you have done in the day or the week, even though you can't do it every day. Sometimes you, when you count, like as I have said, some of the great Kadamba masters used to do, then you would know. And when the time occurs when you are about to kill, then at that time you must apply your practice. When, when does this, when must you practice is when you are in a calm state of mind. If you practice a lot, when you are in a calm state of mind, then when the thing occurs, you would be able to apply the practice. Otherwise, it would just be saying you are practicing, but actually you are not practicing. So also that and work towards being a good human being, which will also help you become a good practitioner. So today I will stop here and ask for questions. Favorite time of the class? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> wow, okay. Thank you very much for your practical teachings. Uh, I have this question about the career, the career of uh, karmic imprints. Career. What, what does or what, yeah what is according to the higher school what is the thing that brings our coming imprints from one life to, to another, another. Yeah, okay. because for other schools they have something solid but yeah, yeah. for the higher school I believe that isn't so what is it okay okay Thank I you. got it so actually the c uh, your question is on the 12 factors of one of the 12 factors of uh, rebirth, uh, dependent arising, right? So c you are asking, what is the carrier of the bad imprints from one life to another? So actually, the, there are four different schools, right? Four different schools, and each of the different schools, they say the carrier is a different. Suppose the mind only school says, it is the mind, but it's an interdependent mind. Sorry, not interdependent, independent mind. So that's what the mind only school says. But there is also um, this uh, Prasangika school. So the reality in real, the Prasangika school must be considered as the final product. So the Prasangika school, it's very complicated matter for that to understand the carrier from one life to another you must understand a little about emptiness which is I we say I right which is I <laughs> what is I when we say I am I am angry I am hungry I want this where do we point as the eye? Is it our limbs, hands, feet? No. Is it our brain? Is it me? Is my brain me? It's not. And is, ma is, mine, is my mind me? We ask these questions in the Prasangika school. At one point, the Prasam Gika school has said, mm, I exist only as a label. It's not an ind independent, it's an dependent on all of the five aggregates. It's dependent on five of the aggregates. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it ro right or wrong, aggregates. And it's dependent of the five of the aggregates. It's not independent of it. And it's just a label of I that is the carrier of, um, carrier of 
bad imprints into one life to another. So it's very complicated in that matter. It goes much more into the Prasangika school, so emptiness side. So it's like, it is, I, the label that we name as I, which is dependent on all of the five aggregates, which is carrying the bad imprint of this life to another life. In a way, that's confusing to understand, right? So I think I should just say that much, because uh, <laughs> it would get more complicated if I talk more. So the one that is carrying the bad imprint is the dependent I, which is uh, depending on all of the five aggregates. So we the the I that is labeled on the five aggregates. Yeah. As you move from life to life, the five aggregates actually changes. Uh, actually, <coughs> the five aggregates, no. Change meaning it doesn't cut itself. The mind, mind part, meaning it's, uh, what do we say? It's continuity, yeah. It's con the mind's continuity. Meaning dependent on the five aggregates, meaning not depending on everything, but one of the five aggregates. Like suppose in the non from REM, there's no form, right? There's, there isn't the form aggregate. aggregate. So the form, non form REM, there is no form. So it cannot depend on the form aggregate. So at that uh, REM, it's dependent on the other four aggregates. Uh, do you get what I mean? Yeah. So the four aggregates are actually mind. Oh yeah, yeah? Uh, so part of mind. Yeah. yeah. So mind and form essentially makes up the five aggregates. Mm. Mind and the form. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in the formless realm, there's no form. In the formless realm, there's no form. So it's right. So there's mind. Yeah, yeah. So in general, the things that goes on life after life in whichever realm is really the mind, actually. Uh, yeah, you can say it's the mind, but it's not the dependent, I'm sorry, independent mind. It's a dependent I, actually, in the Prasangika school. I and the mind are different. In the mind-only school, we have a mind that is considered as I, right? So in the Prasangika school, the, the mm, four minds or whichever, the mind is different from the I. Suppose it's like this because mm, uh, we can say, you know about the chariot, chariot, uh, suppose it's a chariot, right? Chariot, okay. It's a chariot, and the chariot is dependent on all of its uh, features. The wheel, the front design, and it's dependent on everything. But if you take out one, one part and ask whether the wheel is the chariot, whether the design is the chariot, you cannot find something that is different from them. It's one of essence with them, but still, it's not one of them. So, it's a complicated matter. <laughs> so, like that, I is dependent on the mind, and the mind is dependent on the I, but they are not the same. The I also goes, wi goes with the mind, I also goes with the mind to the later next life and previous life. It's one of the continuity that we have. But in Prasangika school, they say the carrier is actually the I, not the mind. Even though the mind is going with it, 
it's also continuing, but it's not the mind. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank okay. you very much. Rinpoche, um, we have a question on the phone. Okay. Um, dear Rinpoche, I find it very hard to practice not gossiping. <laughs> because if you don't gossip in the office, you are like a weirdo. So is there an easier way that we can try? <laughs> that Rinpoche can advise? Thank you. Okay. So actually that's true. Gossiping... Uh, <laughs> gossiping is very hard to mm, very hard to not try not not indulge in because from the small small time we have been uh, practiced or we have been indulging in too much gossiping that we tend to gossip a lot right and uh, it also in this the one who asked the question also is suffering from feeling left out, <laughs> right? Feeling, feeling left out, like if the question, question says it, if I don't gossip, I feel like a weirdo. <laughs> so that means to fit in, actually, to fit in, we are gossiping, <laughs> right? So. Actually, even, even though you uh, gossip, the thing is that you can reduce your gossip. Isn't that right? Gossip meaning, I'm not saying the gossip, like uh, baseless gossip. Suppose, uh, suppose somebody has not done something. And is, is there a base, base for <laughs> gossip, actually? Or are all gossip baseless? Really? <laughs> there is? I thought... I can say that, oh, you know, that day I saw somebody doing this. Oh. So if I say it, it's not it's based on the facts. Oh. <laughs> I'm saying the baseless gossip. A rumor. A rumor, yeah, type of rumor. So even though you cannot practice fully, for a beginner, as I said, uh, Buddha's way is very open. So even though, if if you... You must, I'm a, uh, you must not say every time that I'm just a beginner, I cannot practice, <laughs> but try to practice more and more. But if you cannot practice at first time, you must try to reduce the gossip level. Suppose your level is at level 10 of gossiping. <laughs> your level is at level 10 of gossiping. You must try to <coughs> reduce the level to level 9, then slowly to level 1. Then, then you won't felt. You won't feel the need of gossiping. Also, the cause of this is the cause of gossiping. In this, first we must recognize the cause, right? The cause of gossiping in this particular question is the suffering of fitting in. So first, be comfortable you, with yourself. Don't feel like you are a weirdo. <laughs> and if you delay that cause, then you won't feel the need to gossip. So <laughs> in short, what I mean is just reduce your level. Reduce your level of gossip. In a way, that's also practicing. Practicing, when, when we say practice, we usually think of meditating, meditating and sitting in a posture, we must not think like that. There are many levels of practice. Whichever you feel you can do the most and cultivate it from that level. Reduce, you can do from a reduced level to cultivating it to a higher and higher, higher and higher level. So that's one way of doing it. So one way of not gossiping, you can also think of the effects of gossiping. What will be the effects if what you will feel if somebody gossips about you. If you think about that, then I think you would get a little bit less gossip, gossipy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, any questions? Uh, 
So no questions. Yeah. So actually, somebody told me a question before the teaching. Okay. Um, so uh, she's a volunteer and she helps out in the center to clean the center. Okay. And so she's very hardworking. <laughs> and so she she cleans the center and sometimes she wash and mops the floor. And suddenly, um, while what uh, washing the floor, suddenly a lot of ants float out. <laughs> so she unknowingly killed a lot of ants. Okay. So she feels very bad and she doesn't know what to do because she feels like she really wants okay. to continue her good work to help and clean the centre. Okay. But then um, she's killing all these ants. Okay. Is she killing unknowingly or knowingly? <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> uh, this case, this person is unknowing. <laughs> okay, okay. So there's a difference between killing unknowingly and knowingly. Killing unknowingly is not a bad, is it, it is a bad action, but not considered as a very, very, very bad action. Killing it knowingly and knowing that is much more worse knowing. But if you kill it unknowingly and when you saw that you are killing, if you uh, feel guilty about it, then that's very good. Uh, actually, there was, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. Uh, Buddha actually had said in his monk's vows that you shall not kill, right? You shall not kill. So, when the students with calivarians, they actually didn't kill. They practiced it to the fully. And when they were going to drink water, uh, at that time, they usually drink the river water, right? When they took the river water, and of course they have calivarians, they saw that there is a lot of bacteria in it, in the water, bacteria and small insects in it. So that they were not able to drink the water thinking, if I drink, I would be killing all these small, small insects that I have not seen. So I have not seen, I, I have seen, sorry, to Calivarians. So when they asked Buddha, it was like, if you cannot see something with your eyes, how would you stop it from happening? So in a way, it's our ignorance that is causing this, that we are killing it unknowingly, then the one of the, even if you kill unknowingly, one of the best remedies if, is guilt. As you know in Buddhism, guilt is supposed to be one of the best remedies. So actually, then how to unkill, try to collect you can also try this, try to collect them and put them in a safe place, but actually there's no safe place. <laughs> so that's a very hard, yeah, in our life it's very, actually very hard to uh, contemplate or should I say practice, practice everything every time is very hard, right? So even though, if you are doing it knowingly, then that's worse. If you are doing it unknowingly, then the best is thinking, I killed this, but I didn't have any intention of doing it and trying to remedy it through the four powers. You know, the, the four powers, so the power of eradication and power of, so there are four powers. I don't exactly remember the English terms for it. So, through that, you can remedy yourself. So, it's like this. If you perform a bad karma, it's not like you cannot remedy it. You have to uh, experience the effects. You can uh, not experience the effects through the four powers, the doing of the four powers. So, of course, when I, I have told you that 10 non-futures, non, non, non vicious actions. You won't 
just be, now from today, I'm not going to get angry. You cannot put a vow like that, right? Of course, we will get angry at some time. Certain point of time, we will get angry. We will lie. These days, lying is so easy to s social networking. We lie a lot. <laughs> so, it's very easy to lie. So, even if you lie, just try to reduce it. Reduce the way that you are lying and try to be guilty of it and not let the guilt con consume you but to the four powers uh, of eradication and all you can remediate it so that's one way to do it yeah any other so if okay so this two will be the last question okay this two Hi, uh, thank you, Rainbow Chi. Yeah. Um, just like you mentioned that um, we don't practice enough because we do not we, we don't know suffering enough. Yeah, yeah. So, what would be your advice for us to practice harder then? Okay, okay. <sighs> to practice harder, I'm not saying that you should suffer so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying you should suffer as in like hit yourself and <laughs> I'm not saying like that. So to practice more, you must, there are two types of practitioners, right? One who just go by the blind faith, just by faith, and one who analyzes whether this is true or not and goes to practice his or her practices like that. So the one who has the reasoning to practice and to reflect, time to reflect on what he does is much, I think the motivation is much more stronger for that type. So the way to practice more would be thinking of the effects. Why do we, usually when we work hard, why do we work hard? We work hard because we want to have a happy life at the, at when you retire, right? When you retire, you want to have a happy and <coughs> a, like a, with no financial problems and like that. We want like that type of, so that's why we work hard in the first part. So we must think, why must I do good actions? Why must I practice? Because the same reason applies. We want happiness, right? So to get happiness, we must practice. It's for your own good. That's one way of thinking. And one way of thinking is cause the law of having faith and having analyzed a lot, having faith on the certainty of karma, unless you do something the certainty of karma. If you have unwavering faith on the certainty of karma, then you would of, of course want to practice more. But of course for you all, it's very hard to integrate practice as you all have a very busy life. But as I told you before, practicing doesn't mean think, sitting like that. Practicing is also thinking. Thinking, thinking that thinking about the effects, thinking about the negative effects. When you think too much about the, when you think a lot about the negative effects, you would have a type of, a, what do we say? At the back of your mind, if you are about to do something bad, you would have, this is bad, I can't do this. This effect will be that. So you would have something on the back of your mind that is saying you to stop. So to integrate practice, first is reasoning more, reasoning more and having more, uh, analyzing more on the cause and effect and good, com good cause, good actions causes good effect, bad action causes bad effect, analyzing more on that. And after you have analyzed and gained a type of realization that you have 
that type of uh, law, there, there is of that type of law, then practice automatically starts because you have faith in something. So in a way of practicing also in the Kadam, I think practices, it's usually said, think of impermanence, think of uh, your life's impermanence. If you think of that, then you would see that when you pass away and go into the next life, wealth won't help you, your friends won't help you, can't help you. Then you would see that there is only dharma which can help you. So in a way, thinking like that, thinking of the impermanence of your own life, impermanence of wealth and everything could also be beneficial to help you. So practice uh, doesn't mean you have to stay like this and um, meditate on something. You can be b having food and thinking about the negative effects of getting angry. You can just be sitting like that, right? You can just be sitting like that and thinking about that. Or you may be going to a bus or in a taxi to work. <coughs> then if you have free time, you can think of negative effects of karma. If we, the main thing is thinking of the reason why the more you think about the reason, the more motivation you have to practice. So in short, motivation is very important. So how to get that motivation depends on individual, but these are the ways that, that are said in the text that you should practice. So the last question. The question is, can one take probiotic Probiotic. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then? Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. Killing the bad bacteria. <laughs> right? Is it right? Okay, so, yeah, that's a question that. Uh, actually, I had given a small answer. For us, I think that type of, even though that's a bad action, but we are dependent, right? We are dependent that the bad, it's very complicated. We are dependent on the bacteria for, we are taking the bac sorry, probiotics, which uh, will kill the bacteria. Is that what? Is it not probiotic, antibiotic? Okay, okay. Okay, 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 okay. So it's like a type of antibiotic. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Okay, so whatever. Uh, so. <laughs> okay. If, even if you take probiotics, it's uh, as Buddha has said. This type of are something that we cannot control. Something that we cannot, suppose killing an ant, we can control, right? Because it's something that we see and we are not, if we don't kill that ant, it's not that we are going to die or it's not that we are going to have illness in our bodies. We can clean them and put them in a, another spot which doesn't bother us. So taking that type of, even though it's a, it may be a bad action, but actually Buddha has said that these are like the things that you cannot control. The untrained, unlike bodhisattvas who don't have bacteria in their body, <laughs> unlike bodhisattvas, is something that we cannot control. We are dependent on all the living beings inside us, like the bad bacteria inside us. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of, bacteria that we are dependent on and also there are bad bacteria which affects us which we have to kill <laughs> in other suppose viruses not I don't think virus is called mm, living but there are bad bacteria which causes us illness right so I don't think that applies that much it is a bad deed but I don't think the that type of bad deed may 
give you bad experiences. It may have a small effect, but it's not that strong. Actually, killing something, when you say killing, there is different levels of effects that you get. The larger the body, <laughs> the effects are more, <laughs> in a way. So actually, it's very complicated. The workings of karma is very complicated. And Buddha has said it, of course. So I don't think, of course, you can take probacteria. Uh, sorry, not probacteria, <laughs> probiotics. Uh, probiotics. Uh, course it's uh, so it doesn't apply that I don't think we are because we don't have control over it I don't think that applies as that much so it's not very considered a very bad karma but something that we can control and we are still doing it that's more of a worse karma so that's short Thank you, Ramji. Thank you. So, yes. <laughs> now we'll do dedication.